in 2004, I, in 2004, I uh, went back to my home church and assumed uh, the position of, position of senior pastor and really praying to the Lord why um, uh, the Lord asked me to come back and uh, what should be my role from now on. And it became clear as, as I prayed that the Lord wanted the church, which is really a good church, uh, church that had three B's and church that had wonderful worship, good fellowship, and strong Sunday school. Uh, the Lord wanted the good church to become missional. So what I did first is to come up with a 12-week course on rethinking the church. Uh, in other words, a study on ecclesiology. Uh, so what I am sharing with you, I put that into 12-week course, step by step. Uh, but I realized that some church members were angry at the title. And they, one of them approached me and said, Pastor, I don't like this title. And I said, why? Because you are insinuating that the way we've been thinking about the church is wrong. Hence, rethinking the church. Now, you know, if I were to do it again, I would be a lot more diplomatic. I wouldn't title the course Rethinking the Church because uh, that he's right, because I am being very confrontational. Hey, you look at you guys, you've been thinking church all wrong. And let me teach you how to think church right. And I guess that's how I came across. So I wouldn't use this title. I would use maybe another title like Missional Church or something like that, you know. Uh, anyway, 12 weeks. And uh, because I uh, came from seminary to local church, my operational style ha had not yet changed. So I required them to read a lot of books. Uh, so over the 12 weeks, they were required to read three books and write report on each book. <laughs> now, I, the first 10 years, I was very faithful in this. So every, uh, bo in both two semesters per, per year, uh, I think together more than six, seven hundred people have gone through this program with me in our church. By then, I was able to train all deacons and all elders in our church, uh, okay, so that they are now on board. They understand exactly when I say missional church. Uh, that doesn't mean there was no resistance. Some refused to be part of this course. Those especially who were already elders, they came to me and they were unpleasant. They said, you know, why do we have to read this? Look, we were doing very well. Our church has grown. Look, before you came, our church, we have 3,000 members. So why do you think we need to go through this? If we didn't do anything wrong, I mean, or if we did, if we did something wrong, the church would not have grown. So they were very upset. Some of them were very upset that now I was introducing membership classes and this and that to make, to really tighten the church. It was almost like, you're not welcome in our church unless you go through 12 weeks and you read three books and you produce the reports and you go through membership classes. So people were coming and saying, saying ah, this is not the church I don't think Jesus would have designed. Jesus never asked for book reports. And uh, one of the leaders was actually very, very upset. So I told them, uh, at that time, I remember reading Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Church, and I think chapter 17 is on membership. He has a very good chapter on why we need to require a strong membership. So I photocopied about 30 pages of that chapter, and I gave this to this leader and said, okay, let's read it, and a month later, we'll come back and we'll discuss. And now you will understand why I place such emphasis on membership. A month later, I catch this gentleman in the church, and I said, 
Sir, let's talk about this. He said, I haven't read it. Why did you not read it? Because I might change mind. <laughs> That's how he was set. He didn't want to change. So people like that, I, I could not fight. You know? I, I don't want to fight. And I might, I might get kicked out if I, if I am you know, not careful. So all those leaders who did not want to change, the best I could do was just patiently wait until one by one they all retired. You know? And that's what happened. They, all, they came of age and they all retired. And, but you know, we're still very good friends. And uh, we, uh, now they understand why I was so adamant about this. Now they understand. And they're all like praying. And so they're all, we're, all, we're all together. It's in very good uh, sit, uh, position. Now, three years ago, uh, I produced four weeks course, really a truncated version of 12 weeks because it's, it was too long. But these were the things uh, that I discussed in four weeks. Uh, church in crisis. And now, how do we restore the church to become more missional? Uh, what is church? Church is the community of the spirit. And so on one end, church is the community of the spirit, but on the other end, also church is in the world. And I, and I also talked about missional leadership and the characteristics of missional church. And finally, case studies on missional church. And the textbook, and, and look at this, people were so interested. And where lots of people came and studied with me. These are, most of them already studied 12 weeks with me, but they were studying again. You know, I, this is what I find. If you, are, if you persevere and if you continuously and, and consistently talk about one important thing that you will not step down, you will not compromise, then people will begin to take you seriously. But if you go to workshop here and, and then you say, well, let's try this, and then it doesn't work. You go to another workshop and you come back and you say, let's try this people will not listen to you. I don't mean go to only one workshop. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But choose your cause very carefully. And once you choose it, stick with it. As though your ministerial life depends on it. And uh, this book, it, this is Korean uh, translation, but you know, I strongly encourage you to read this book by J.D. Greer. J.D. Greer, G-R-E-E-A-R, -E -E book titled, Gaining by Losing, Gaining by Losing, by J.D. Greer. Very, very good book on missional church. So, I had uh, this book as a textbook to read and also book report. See, I was compromising myself. No more three books, just one book. But it was a very, very good book, very important book. And uh, I got some people to, as, uh, this is what they wrote. Uh, let me quickly translate. This is what they wrote in their reports. They said, for example, in the past I thought about my faith as doing all kinds of service in the church. But through this education I learned that my commitment should not stay within the church, but it must go outside the church into the world and begin uh, to be part of the, the mission of God. That's what I learned in this course. And I said, right on. Another person wrote, he says, well, I thought that church was all about God creating this, this body, this community, so that saints can s stay together in harmony. But now I learned that, no, that's not what church is. Church is it, with prayer and God's word, that we are to go into the world, into our local communities, and be witness for Jesus. That ought to be our primary call. And I said, you got it right. Um, another person said, I now learn that just uh, because church is, 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 is growing doesn't mean the kingdom is growing. That that kind of thinking is not correct. That our, what God really wants is that we are to live out God's kingdom in our life and at work. And so from now on, I will show my uh, good witness uh, as God's witness in day-to-day in, 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 in -day living. Now, in this uh, study, 
Um, uh, we looked at three churches in the States, uh, very good churches that we could really emulate. And uh, when you have a chance, please look at these churches. You can go on the web, uh, website and see what these churches are doing. But the Church of the Savior, Washington, D.C., by far is, is the most amazing church that I've ever seen. Um, started by Pastor Gordon Cosby, and he pastored this church for over 60 years. And before he died, the, the greatest gift that he gave to his congregation was selling the property and giving it away. So the church has no church building because he was adamant, he was clear that church is not about building. Church is about God's people committed to be sent out into the world. I don't have time to go into detail, but um, you know, there's so much to learn about this church. Very clear ecclesiology. Uh, you know, that's what pastors today need to, to have, a clear understanding of what a church is. Strict membership. In this church, to become a member of this church, it takes anywhere between one to two years. And you need to go through internship to, go to become a member of this church. Internship. Like you would become a doctor, medical doctor. And even then when you become a member, it's good for only one year. You have to renew every year. <laughs> and uh, in the membership, there are three major requirements. Number one, you need to spend one hour with the Lord every day in word and prayer. Number two, you need to give tithing to the church and also uh, enrolled in continuing uh, training. They call it the, the Servant Leadership School. Number three, and most important, you need to be engaged, actively engaged in some kind of work outside the church. That is the criteria for, to stay in as a member in this church. And they've done some amazing work. And you can go into their website and uh, learn more about it. But it was Pastor Gordon Cosby that really inspired me to think about the importance of balancing between inward journey and outward journey. You cannot just drive your people, do this, do that, and they'll all get burnt out. Hence. You need to design your program in the, in the church in such a way that they are well taken care of, spiritually well taken care of. At the same time, they're not just spiritually getting fatter and fatter every day, but they're actually going out and engaging in meaningful work for God's kingdom. So hence, balance between inward journey and outward journey. And community spirit, so important that we're doing this together, never alone. And he emphasized that we need to live with the poor. Always have the poor near you, and you need to work with the poor. And he also said that every member is now released to, to engage in creative ministry. Just create whatever God has given you. Create. So a couple of guys, after they got their membership, they were very happy as they were coming out of the church building. Uh, they pray to the Lord, Lord, now we have to create some kind of ministry outside the church in order to stay as a member. <laughs> what do we do? And the Spirit told them, open your eyes. Look at the people around you. Now they were in the suburb called, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, something Adams um, in, in one of the rough neighborhoods of Washington, D.C. And uh, known for all kinds of uh, a drug trafficking, and also shooting. Um, and uh, the Spirit said, you see these people sleeping on the street. Why don't you go and minister to them and create a ministry? Hence, started the ministry called Christ House, which is a uh, ministry to the drug addicts. Because a lot of people are on the street because they're addicted to drug. And so this ministry is about, all about detoxification, restoration, and then giving them jobs, uh, helping them be on their uh, feet again. Wonderful ministry, still going on. Yeah. Uh, another church that um, is well worth discussing, I don't have the time, but uh, Austin Stone Community Church in Texas, 
12 university graduates started a missional church. And they literally transformed uh, one of the uh, slums in their city in, in Austin, Texas, by literally transforming a high school that was known for illegitimate birth and high school dropout, that kind of stuff. In fact, something like 300 volunteers from this church, they all went after school and uh, provided whatever counseling, whatever big brother, big sister, that kind of stuff to really transform that school. Another example is a Dream Center in Los Angeles, uh, Echo Park, a section called Echo Park. Now, it's funny, Matthew Barnett uh, is a young man when he was 21 or two years old. He came to this area thinking that one day I'm gonna become a mega past church pastor. So he started preaching, but the problem is that people were not coming to him. So he said to God, Lord, I want to become a mega church pastor, but people are not coming. What should I do? And the Spirit said, don't wait until people come to you. You go to them and minister to them. You go to them and ask them what their needs are. So he went to them and found out that there are like last serious drug addictions in this area and so on. And so that's how he began to meet the needs of the people and preach the gospel. And one day, a Catholic uh, hospital approached him and said, hey, we have this huge hospital that we want to relocate. You want to buy this building at a bargain price. So something like one-third or one-fourth of a market value. Uh, his ministry buys this. And uh, like first floor is, is like food. Second floor is drug uh, uh, for people with drug uh, problems and et cetera, et cetera. And today, Dream Center is truly what a church ought to be doing. And uh, uh, now God has a sense of humor because his original goal was to become a mega church pastor. One day, a mega church approaches him and says, would you like to become our pastor? So he becomes a pastor of a mega church right next to Dream Center and he's doing both. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> so vision is so important. So when we were... Uh, when our, when Young Nak Church was really trying to become missional, I was really sharing this vision with people through studies, by taking our elders to field trips like this, and saying, look, our church can do better than this, that we are not here just to minister to our own people. Now, this brings me to the next point. After you share vision, training is so crucial. You have to train them. You have to train them what it means to live out a missional life. So training begins with, for me, my own pastoral staff. Every, I work with 23 pastoral team members. It's a big church about, uh, I don't want to talk about number, it's a big church. Anyway, so my pastors have no choice but to study books and write reports. What, this is what you get when you get a pastor from seminary. So this is the book called The Mission of the People of God, a wonderful book. It, it tells you that our mission and God, what God is doing in the world is not just saving souls, but restoring his creation. You know? So we read this together. Uh, the year before, we read J.D. Greer's Winning by Losing. Now, after you work with your past pastoral team, the next job is now you need to work with your elders. Our elders have no choice but to read books and discuss. So this is J.D. Greer's uh, Winning by Losing. They all had to read it. And then after they've read it, I asked, I bought like over 100 copies of this book and gave all the small group leaders in our church and said, you need to read it because for whole year, we're going to do a Bible study in our small groups. So they all went through it together. I got reports later that people were getting tired of this book because every month they come together, they were re studying this book. Anyway, and then uh, inward, outward journey. God gave us a wonderful uh, a retreat center. And so this is a 30-acre property. And we, it, we conduct silent retreat. And church members are requi well, not required. They're strongly encouraged to go there one weekend per year to do nothing but silent retreat, to connect with, the, with, with God. 
And look at all this training that is available in the, in the church. This is ongoing uh, because, you know, you, you have to really strike a balance between inward journey and outward journey. And so we encourage our church members to constantly enroll in the school of learning. Uh, and each item, for example, Alpha course is for people, beginners. Uh, some are seekers. They come, they go through 11 weeks of this program together, and many, if not most, become Christians. Uh, and then they go through membership class, there's discipleship training, uh, couples class, uh, New Testament, Old Testament navigation, uh, mission or church class, silent retreat, intercessory prayer class. Like these things go for 11 weeks at a time. Uh, quiet time, how to, how to have quiet time, how to memorize scripture, etc., etc. And you can see these are the brochures uh, we use to really get people to enroll in uh, two semesters. Now, this is in Korean, but let me show you this. This is for seekers. And this, all these choices here, these are for disciple making, next step. And these are for all uh, uh, workers, church workers. Okay. So it's in that kind of a, a level. Uh, course description. Now, we make it such that if you want to be an elder, if you want to be a deacon in our church, you have to go through certain courses and complete them. Yeah. And then it's all recorded in our uh, computer. And then also, just on missions training, we have all these different courses that we, we uh, uh, provide. Sorry, this is in, in Korean. I didn't have time to translate. But basically, uh, we've also developed 12-week course on how to reach other people groups in Toronto. Okay. And now, after training, praxis. Now, putting into practice now. So, okay, this is what we talked about before. Now, we have a big work going on in Cambodia. And that's, this is me right here, yeah. Now, here, this is more important stuff. Um, missional groups. So church has small groups. They come together in small groups. Before, they were so much fellowship oriented. So I kept pressuring them. Please, less fellowship and more ministry. So they are now slowly tr transforming. So the, the leader, leaders of the small group, they are required to report every month what they've done. So then I will look at it and see what, what they've done. Before they were well, we celebrated such and such a member's birthday. We celebrated such and such member's daughter's wedding. I mean, yeah, but that's not why you exist. And now uh, I am happier if they say, well, we went to do this ministry or that ministry. Now, in Toronto, there's a notorious area called Jane and Finch. This particular area is known for uh, shooting, and drug addiction. And uh, our church members began to now go into this area, which is incredible, isn't it? And uh, this gentleman is deacon in our church. He's a soccer player. One day I realized that Youngnak soccer team ceased to exist because coach took off to Jane and Finch area to create a, another soccer team at the expense of our own church soccer team. So our kids, all of a sudden, they lost their, uh, their team and their, their, their coach. And instead, he went to this area and uh, gathered together these kids who were coming from somewhat disadvantaged background. And, 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 and they, they're doing very well now. And look at this. Their parents are invited to barbecue. 
and we're working very closely with the church at the corner of Jane and Finch to help this church reach out to some of these uh, troubled teens. Ministry to homeless. Ah, this is a very interesting thing. So we wanted to uh, start churches, not just Korean churches, but other churches in Toronto. And one time, a couple from Thailand, a um, uh, Chinese couple who can speak Thai language, uh, came to us. And so we challenged them. Why don't you start a Thai church in Canada and we'll support you, we'll help you. And uh, the, the couple said, we like to, but in the last few years we've lived in Toronto, we've never heard somebody speak Thai. Oh, is that so? Well, let's pray about that. Sure enough, a few weeks later, we get a phone call. Would you believe it? I was doing my shopping, and in the background, I hear people speaking Thai. I think that's a sign from the Lord that I should start a Thai church. So this couple started Thai church. Now, when they were in Bangkok, when they were living in Bangkok, before they immigrated to Toronto, Canada, they were only able to lead two people to Christ in their entire, entire life as Christians. But in Toronto, they were able to baptize 40 people, 40 Thai people. They were so shocked and so encouraged that they decided to go back to Thailand, and they now planted a church in Bangkok. Is that incredible? Yeah. Now, those of you who are missionaries in Thailand, you know what it's like. It is so difficult to convert a Thai because they're staunch Buddhists. Yeah. But they were so encouraged that they left the Thai church in the hands of another believer, and they went. Our church, our, our job is simply to come along and encourage. And we helped uh, uh, this couple get trained at Tyndale Seminary in Toronto. And then off they went to Thailand. So if you can see this, this is a map of Toronto. And the different colors indicate different language groups. Like I said, it is a sin not to cross culturally and share the gospel in Toronto. And just to be happy because in your church you've got so many Korean faces and you're so happy. You have a Korean soccer team, you have a Korean basketball team, Korean volleyball team. It's suffocating, right? It's time to resign as a Korean soccer team coach and go to Jane and Finch and start a totally <laughs> different a t a team altogether. So our church has helped these different churches like this. Yeah. Even Filipino church, we started. There is a, a group of Filipinos in downtown that nobody is willing to plant church there. Why? Because there, it's really for new immigrants and you, know, you go there and the church is not going to survive. Well, we did. We went there. It was very tough. But uh, after five years, the church is now mostly started with Filipinos, but now has become a multicultural church. And then the, our church uh, decided to rent a facility. In, 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 instead of asking church members to, to go to the world, we said, why doesn't the church, uh, no, instead of asking people to come to church, why doesn't the church go to people? That's what we did. We rented this facility uh, in a commercial area, and we began providing programs uh, to reach out to Koreans. Uh, some of the it's more of a cultural programs, but through this, like for example, in translation, number one, one course is about uh, cyber addiction. If your kid, your teenager is is addicted, internet addicted. You come and we'll, we'll help you how to sort this out. So it was meeting the needs of the parents. Number two, how do you communicate with your children? We'll teach you how to communicate with the children. Now, we, we said it outright that this is a ministry of Yangnak Church. We're not hiding anything. But since these classes are held in a neutral territory, we encourage anybody to come, non-believers to come. 
And also in Toronto, there are a lot of Iranians. So now, r recently, uh, we've been trying to reach out to Iranians in Toronto. And in order to do this, the pastor has to be passionate about this. So, I go into supermarket, and I get hold of, this is not a blanket, folks. This is actually bread that uh, Iranians love to eat. It's called sangak bread. Sangak means in, in, in Persian language, in Farsi, simply means uh, uh, pebble stone. That's what sangak is. So in the 11th century, the per Persian army would march, and then they would stop, and they would set up the tent for the night. They would get pebble stones from their pockets. They all collect them, put them together in one area, and then they will heat it up. And then they will make it flat, and they will put their flour on top and make a nice bread like this. So, I must have bought at least half a dozen of these, and one set to elders, one set to pastors, please eat. <laughs> and, and so on, yeah. And now, uh, this is more our recent work we're doing. Now, our church decided that we want to set up a mission base in Central America because there are more and more people retiring at the age of 65 and they're just going out to golf course or they're busy looking after their grandchildren. So we said, no, that's not the way we're gonna retire. So we're gonna mobilize people to do more, to do more mission work. But from Canada to come to Philippines or Cambodia, it's too far and too expensive. So we, we contacted Dominican Republic and we decided to work with the urban poor. So we were given this piece of land here and just imagine all around this land are just squatters, okay? And this area alone has 2,000 kids. So we're in the, in the now in the process of building kindergarten and community center so that people will be mobilized. These are senior citizens, people over 65 that I, that I was part of last January. They went there and they went around the neighborhood uh, it's incredible. Some of them are 70, 75 years old. They, they memorize the four spiritual laws in Spanish. Yeah, and they, they started just sharing the gospel with them. And we did this uh, uh, inaugural ceremony. We promised to them that very quickly, very soon, we're going to build the kindergarten for you guys, and then you're going to be in charge. You're going to be uh, educating your own people. So, these are some of the continuing challenges that I face every day. Um, as the church gets bigger, the church needs to go smaller. And we need to really work on small group ministry where people are accountable. And uh, we need to pr create more and more ministry teams that will bring changes in the world. Now, because of limited time, obviously I was not able to tell you everything that we do as a church. It's, it's only a sample. Now, these are continuing questions on my mind. Are church members living missionally from Monday to Saturday? What about those who do not respond in the church? I found that no matter how hard I try, uh, about one-third of our church members are on board with me. About one-third they act like they're on board. And then the, the final one third, they couldn't care less. They were like, Pastor, we are not gonna oppose you. You do your missional thing, I'll do my thing. I, I show up on Sunday, I worship, and I give my offering. Please touch me not. <laughs> so that's my prayer. How do I, about one third are gung-ho about this. One third, yeah, they will move if I ask them to move. And the other third, even when Jesus asks, they will not move. <laughs> and we're asking this question, what kind of impact do our members have locally and globally? And I can tell you that we are having some serious impact. We are starting churches in ethnic pockets in the city of Toronto. Okay. Uh, we are changing that area called Jane and Finch, notorious for shooting and, uh, and uh, 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 drug addiction. Uh, we, we are changing 
this one area uh, in Cambodia called uh, uh, Kampung Spu, that area, big orphanage went up. There was no electricity before. Now the village has electricity because our, we, we put up 1.5 kilometers of e um, electrical posts. And so they got, they, they got the, the vill village people got benefited from that. And then they came to us and asked, well, you built a nice orphanage, but the problem is that we don't have orphans in our family. How can our kids take advantage of whatever you guys are teaching inside? So what we did was we created, we, we built a community center for these village people. So now they come before school and after school, they learn computer, they learn English, they learn music, things like that. And for the very first time in that village history, four ladies went to university in Phnom Penh. This is unheard of, because when girls grow up to be like 16, 17, uh, the, the fathers are interested in sending them to factories so that they can bring money. But we told them, please just wait another four years until you allow them to, to finish university and then they can become real asset in your family. Now these are Christian girls and they have now gone to university. Uh, some of them in their second year, their third year, you know, they're doing very, very well. And uh, so that village, the future is very bright. I believe uh, we're making some impact locally and globally. Anyway, so I'm telling you, that it can be done with persistence, with vision, it can be done. Now I'd like to open up for question and, and answer.